Hello there, THP 494 and 598. Um, so today what we're going to look at is uh, the example that we're going to build in class. We're going to do a little bit more work in class and I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the ins and outs of what we're doing here, but I want there to be a record of how we actually go about building this thing so that when you have questions and you're kind of fighting with this on your own, uh, you have something to go back to. So for us to get started today, uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to open up a network and we're just going to get rid of that default project and we're going to start from scratch here. So we're going to, we're going to talk about the, the first project in class here on Tuesday. Um, but before we get there, you know, a part of what I'm after is thinking about copy art as a way that we're exploring and kind of diving into how we think about what it is that we want to make and generate, right? Inspiration comes from a lot of different places, and in this particular instance, what I want you to do is I want you to think about what's something that already exists out in the world, something that you've seen, that you like, that's interesting to you, and how do we take that and use that as a starting point, and then exploit that, explore that, kind of pull it apart and peer inside of it, and you know, find something unexpected out of that. So to that end, uh, I have an example for us to get started today. So the example that I'm using is actually a little bit of video feedback, right? So this is a camera pointed at uh, a television and creating a little feedback loop. It should, you know, look familiar. Its uh, first occurrence was really like way back in uh, the 1950s, right? It, almost as soon as there was uh, a camera, uh, you ended up with feedback loops of, uh, where you can actually, you know, capture the signal from the camera, and it was uh, originally something that artists wanted to avoid and kind of broadcasters wanted to avoid because they didn't like the appearance of it. It was um, unappealing. So it wasn't until the 60s and 70s that this became a technique, a filmic technique, uh, that was exploited in lots of different kinds of installation art and video art. So we're going to take a look at how we might do something like this in software, you know, kind of simulate this video feedback effect, and what might happen if we start to play with some of the parameters of that a little more closely, right? Okay, so that is what we're after today. I can go ahead and close that for us to get started. So the first ingredient for us to consider in this whole process uh, is I want us to actually start by adding a button to our... Well, let's go ahead and add a container first, right? We have need a thing for this to actually live inside of. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to call this feedback. Because I'm going to call this particular container the name of the effect that I want to actually build here. Well, you know, you can call yours whatever you want. I'm going to call mine feedback. One of the things that I want us to do in this process, right, this is like, there are a couple different things that I'm after in all of this, but I'd like us to actually embed our research um, that we've done for this particular project here inside of uh, our network. So I'm going to go ahead and add a button to do this. So a part of this assignment you'll notice, we'll talk about in class, is that I actually want you to uh, do a little bit of, bit of research, find something, find an effect that you want to replicate or emulate in some way. And find an example of that out on the web. I don't care if that's an image or a video. I prefer video personally because uh, that's a lot of the medium that we work in. But if you have just a still image, that's fine. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to embed that piece of research right, right here into your network. So you don't have to give me a separate file. And it also gives us the handy uh, experience of getting to learn how to do something uh, different here instead of touch center. So I'm going to go ahead and change the size of this button. I already know here from the get-go that I need it to be a little bit wider. Um, perfect. So I'm going to make mine 70 wide. I'm going to head here inside of my button. Uh, I'm going to take this button guy here, and I only need to change the name of it uh, on the top here. And so I'm going to call it research. Research. Great. Wonderful. And then the other thing that I need to have is I need to have the link, or I need to have the URL to the actual uh, file that are to the YouTube video or whatever it is that I'm uh, going to be using, right? So in our case, right, if I was to pull that video back up here, we can see that uh, there's my URL, and we're going to use that here in one second. So I'm going to go ahead and add a text dat 
I'm going to call this text.url. Great. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and find my video here. I'm going to go ahead and grab this link um, either place, right? I could grab the HTTPS address or I could call, uh, grab just the regular uh, HTTP address. And I'm going to go ahead and actually just dump that bada bing right here into this your, uh, tech stack called URL. And, and we'll see why I'm doing that here in a second. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and add a panel execute to that also. So what I'm after here is um, what I want us to add to this button, the functionality that I'd like us to have, is I'd like us to be able to click on this button and for it to open that URL in a browser window. That's what I'd like to have happen here today. So the first thing we've done right to help that happen is we've gone ahead and put our URL here in a text stat so we can actually get to it. And now what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to uh, modify this panel execute tab to do the thing that we actually want it to do. So I'm going to go ahead and leave this uh, panel value right on state. That's a fine way to look at this. Right? If I was to open up this uh, button, I'll see that its state changes right when I click on it. And actually we can see that right now it looks like it's set to toggle. So let's go ahead and change that. We're going to move back out one level. We're going to hit the button and we'll just make that momentary. So now we should see that when we click on this button, it just fires uh, once, right? Perfect. I'm only going to focus in writing this script on the off to on change, right? So I'm going to delete these other definitions, these other functions that are in here because I don't need them for this particular um, trick that I'm trying to do. So the first thing that I need to do here is I actually need to import another Python library here into Touch Designer so that I can use this, right? And so uh, this brings up some really interesting uh, kinds of things that we can do with Python that we uh, wouldn't necessarily be able to do uh, with a different kind of scripting language or a different approach. And one of those things is that we can take advantage of the fact that there are a ton of libraries that already exist for us to do lots of different kinds of operations. Um, if I wanted to navigate to, uh, to figure out what are the, some of the libraries that are already here waiting for me, right? I could go to, uh, I think in my case it's, on, it's in C, it should be in Program Files, in the Derivative folder, in Touch Designer 088, uh, bin, I believe, where this lives, lib, or lib for library. And we can see here that I've got a ton of different Python libraries that exist here. Right? So the one that I'm particularly interested in is one down here that I already know exists called Web Browser. And Web Browser, if we were to take a look at it, uh, gives us a lot of different things that we can do with it. Right? We can see that there's um, uh, several different kinds of functions and calls that exist inside of this thing. If we were to scroll down, uh, we could see a synthesizer controller here. But this is useful. Create controller when user specifies a path to an entry in the browser. Right? Lots of exciting things that we can actually uh, get a hold of here. Um, and we're not going to worry about a whole lot of exciting stuff there, but it's important to know that that exists. So in order to take advantage of that, the first thing that we have to do is we actually need to import web browser. And so we're going to go ahead and um, the first line in this uh, function that we're going to ask uh, Touch Designer to do for us is we're going to ask it to import web browser as the first thing that it's going to do. Next, we're going to ask, next we're going to go ahead and define our URL, right? So I want URL to be equal to the operator that's called URL, right? This guy down here. And I'm going to specify uh, that I just want the text from it. So I'm going to do dot text to specify that I want this line right here out of it. Excellent. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just going to go ahead and write the call, right? So I'm going to want web browser, B R O W S E R, web browser dot open. So I'd like to just go ahead and open that URL. That is what I would like to have happen here, right? So let's go ahead and see if we made that actually work. So I'm going to make this viewer active. 
I'm going to click right over here. Perfect. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and let's open up a new tab here and let's try clicking this again and see if this works. And lo and behold, there is my video, right? Every time I click this, I open a new tab. So that works like a charm. Perfect. There are lots of different things that we might uh, exploit or do with that particular approach, right? For our particular assignment, I'm just wanting you to go ahead and open up uh, the URL for your particular piece of research. You might think about a situation where if you had a uh, an IP address for any particular kind of equipment that existed on your network, this would be another way that you could actually open up um, a web browser to get to that particular piece of equipment, right? Like your your router or your switch or your projectors, anything that lives on a network uh, inside of a theater or inside of an installation, you would be able to open up a web browser to get to that particular um, web interface for that thing. I won't belabor that particular point, right? Um, but it is important to note that we imported web browser and then we took advantage of what web browser was to actually accomplish the thing that we wanted. Uh, another uh, important thing to know, right? Uh, web browser is a part of one of the is a part of the default Python library, um, and so you can use the uh, um, Python's help online, right, to help you learn how to take advantage of some of these different uh, libraries. So, for example, here, right, we can see that web browser this tells us a lot about how this particular um, library works. And we can see all the different things that we might be able to do with it, uh, that we can take advantage of with it. So there's a whole lot more that we could actually do. Um, we're just using the very simple open and specifying the URL. Perfect. Okay. So now that I've got a button that opens up my research, now we can start to look at uh, building something that actually uh, starts to accomplish the look and feel of what that feedback system uh, was doing for us. One of the things that I'm going to be uh, a real stickler about, right, as we start to work in this class a little bit more, is making sure that we're uh, building networks that are tidy and uh, well thought out in terms of their kind of arrangement and the way that we uh, work with them, right? So to that end, uh, what we'll do is we'll see how we can start to build something uh, kind of in a single network, right? We'll build it on one level and then as we start to build things that are more and more complicated, we'll, st we'll start encapsulating some of those pieces so we can start to really kind of clean up and narrow down uh, what it is that we're building. So the first thing that I want us to think about is let's just try and replicate that visual effect that we're after, right? So I'm going to go ahead and start with a movie file in. One of the particular things that I really liked about that um, example was that it had this really lovely uh, kind of swooping uh, framed feeling to it. Uh, and particularly, we saw all of the different widgets and gizmos and uh, heads up elements that lived inside of uh, the camera itself. So I want us to actually take advantage of that, right? And I've already done a little bit of searching and I found this lovely example that exists out on the web. Perfect. So we're going to use this just as we're uh, kind of experimenting so that we can try and replicate exactly the kind of look and feel of that particular thing. So we're going to go ahead and copy the image URL here. Uh, we'll use our movie file in and we'll just go ahead and dump in the web address. Oops, so we need to make sure that in the tri-state option, right, that we're under constant and not under expression. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, plunk that in there. One of the handy things that we can think about uh, here in touch is that if we don't like, um, like let's imagine that I'm working on the internet right now, but I'm going to be uh, moving to a place where I don't know if I'll have internet, internet connectivity. The way that I've built this network uh, as it is, if I don't have access to the web, as soon as I close this network and open it back up, um, I'm going to go ahead and try and fetch this from the internet, and if I don't have a net connection, then I'm going to get an error in my network. So what could I do? One of the things that I can do for still images, right, things that I just want to capture and fix and then save inside of my network, 
is I can use this lock flag. So by locking this operator, I'm now holding this particular array of pixels in the memory, right? I'm saving it with my actual uh, toe file. So it's going to make my toe file larger, but it's also going to ensure that this asset exists even if I don't have access to the web. All right. Next up here, I realized that in looking at this, I've got this like uh, big logo here in the middle, which is excellent. Well done, Pond5. For the particular look that I'm trying to generate, I want to go ahead and just take that out because I want to have just this framed uh, piece that exists here around the edge. Uh, so we can do some compositing to make that happen, right? I'm going to use a composite. I'm going to go ahead and plug my movie file here in. And I can see that I've got an error, right, um, for this particular operator, and it's because I don't have enough uh, sources yet. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a rectangle top. Perfect. And let's just plug that right into our composite. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and ask this rectangle to have the same dimensions as our movie file in. So we can use some expressions to do that. So here in the common page under resolution, I want the operator that's called movie file in one dot width. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the width. And I'm going to copy this expression. And I'm going to grab the height also. Perfect. So now when I'm compositing these two uh, pieces together, they're the same size. So I don't have to worry about, before we looked at uh, kind of challenges of fixed layer and overlay and how we kind of made sure that things work the right way. We're not going to worry about any of that this particular time around because these two pieces are exactly the same size. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and start futzing with the actual dimensions here in rectangle, the size of our rectangle, so that we have something that just matches the size of the piece that we want to take out, right? So, right about like that. Excellent. Here in my composite mode, uh, or actually before I go any further, I'm going to grab this rectangle. I'm going to go ahead and change the fill color to be black. Excellent. I'm going to use this composite uh, method right here, the operand. And let's go ahead and use under, right? This guy is underneath this one. And I want that to knock out this section right here. Perfect. If we did over, right, this input one, yoink, movie file in is sitting on top of rectangle. So if I wanted over to work, I would just have to rearrange my layer order. And probably what I would do, right, because uh, these crossed wires, I think, can sometimes be deceiving in terms of thinking about layers, is that if I was going to use over, I would just go ahead and rearrange these so that I could really see that this operator, right, this particular top is on, in fact, over this top. That, you know, little piece helps me kind of like uh, maintain my sanity. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to start to think about how we actually build our feedback system. So let's go ahead and, uh, and start building that here. Now, I know that we're going to have, well, well, I do. I know that we're going to run into a problem, so I'm going to insert a null here because it's going to make it a lot easier to kind of do some futzing here down the road. Uh, you don't have to add a null. Um, you'll just have to do some reconnecting. We'll see when we get there uh, what's going on there. All right, so the next step in this is I'm going to go ahead and add a feedback top. And we have to create a feedback loop for this to actually work correctly. I'm going to add a transform because I need a, a transform in this whole situation to make it work the way that I want it to. I'm going to go ahead and add a level because I like to be able to control uh, a little bit more in terms of what's happening with my feedback system that I'm building. Uh, and then I finally, I want to composite some things together. So I'm going to composite uh, what's coming out of this feedback as well as the original source footage. Now the thing I need to do here is in my feedback top I need to establish a target. So I'm going to say that comp2 is my target. Perfect. Uh, and that doesn't look like anything happened. Well first let's make sure that we do add instead of um, multiply. And here we can see that we're, we've got some excellent kind of like pixely noise happening here as we're 
just writing uh, red values constantly on top of themselves over and over and over again. So we have a feedback system that's happening here, but we can't quite see what it is that it's doing. So uh, let's get a closer look at what's happening. So if I head to my transform top here, let's go ahead and scale, and I'm going to scale both of these parameters simultaneously by clicking on the actual word, holding down the middle mouse button, and then scaling down here slightly. And now we can see, right, that in doing that scaling, that part of what's happening is that here in this transform top, like let's just uh, make a copy of a transform top here. Alright, and if I was to not transform my feedback, but just to transform my original null, I could see that I'm scaling it down, right? I'm just making it 80% uh, of its original size. Because it's trapped in this feedback loop, this then gets stacked on top, right? Our kind of frame buffer situation happens so that uh, it happens again and again and again and again, and we can see that we create this kind of infinite tunnel uh, effect. And our composite allows us to take our original and put it there in the background so that we've gone ahead and created this tunnel-like effect. I'm going to go ahead and add a null here to the end. I'm set that to be our background top for a second. So when we look at a little more transforming, we can see this a little bit better. So, right, so scaling is going to allow me to affect that kind of tunnel-like effect that I've got going on. And the amount of scaling that I apply is going to influence how much, right, the kind of like density of that. If I scale above uh, my values, right, now I've got this kind of like infinitely flying towards us kind of feeling. So I can really start to play with, with this a little bit, right? So for our uh, particular example, I'm going to go ahead and leave this, I think, at like 0 0.8, 0 0.8. Oops, point. there we go. That's looking pretty good. I like that. I'm also going to pay close attention to the fact that if I rotate this, right, and I need to actually rotate in maybe more like whole numbers, right, I start to get some of that same trippy effect that was in my example, right? And I can see the, the change kind of propagate its way all the way down. Uh, the pipeline here as it goes through this feedback loop. I'm going to kind of hold on to that idea because I, uh, I know that's uh, particularly interesting and kind of fun. I like that a lot. Uh, and in fact, before I get too far, well, no, let's keep building. We'll, we'll run back into the problems um, that I want us to solve here in not too long. Okay. So I've started to got, I've kind of got a little piece of this feedback system happening here so far. I like that. That's working for me. Uh, so next, let's start to look at uh, how we actually start to think about uh, manipulating this. So in terms of manipulating this, I would like to uh, create just some nice gentle waves that swirl me back and forth. I'm going to use an LFO to do that. And I'm going to go ahead and add some con a constant here also, because I think there's there might be a situation where I might want to change some other parameters as well. I'm going to give this the name TX, TY. My LFO, I can actually name it as well by going to the channel page. And I'm going to call this RZ, because I'm rotating in the Z dimension. We'll see here in a moment. I'm going to merge these together. So now I have TX, TY, RZ. I'm going to go ahead and connect these to a null. And then out of my null, I'm going to export these three channels, X, Y, and Z, transform X, transform Y, and rotate Z, down here to my transform top. So I'm going to go ahead and make this viewer active, and we can just drag these right on over, translate X. Translate Y, rotate Z. Okay, we start to take a closer look here. We can see already that LFO is having some impact, right? Yeah, it's working. 
That also means that if I come over here to this constant and change this value over here, that's actually going to drive those parameters, and that's uh, something that I wanted to, right? I want to be able to build my animation in a chop network and then have it be applied over here um, to my top network. So there's some things here that I might think about doing, right? Like one of the things I might consider is doing a little bit of scaling um, because I'm not totally sure that I want uh, the scaling to work this way right now. I could kind of, kind of go two directions with that. So I'm going to go ahead and insert a map. And the map is going to allow me to adjust my scaling. And here I can specify that my negative 1 to 1 range, uh, maybe I want that to be more like 10 or negative 10, negative 10 to 10. Mm, I'd like a little bit more, maybe more like 25 to 25. Oof, even more than that. Let's go all the way to 45, negative 45 to 45. I like that range of motion, but this is like a little too fast. It's going to make me seasick if I'm not careful. So in my LFO, I'm going to go ahead and change the frequency down to say like 0.1. That might still be like a little fast. Uh, what about 0 0.05? And now I might come back and change this one more time. And maybe 30 is more like of a happy medium in there. Okay, yeah, that's that's doing much better up with that. I'm digging that feeling. Now I can notice, right, one of the interesting things that I'm seeing happening here is that as we spin, I've got some really interesting clipping that's happening in this spiral pattern. So what gives? What's actually happening there? Well, if I come down here to my transform, I can see that that rotation, right, the spin, is actually taking my uh, first frame that's being scaled down and is passing it outside of the resolution area, right? So it's actually trimming that a little bit. And that is not what I want. I would like um, to be able to preserve the edge of this frame as it heads all the way down this thing. I don't want that weird clipping effect to happen. So how can I fix that? Well, there are a couple of different ways I might fix it. And the approach that I'm going to take here is to think about how we can um, do a little bit of compositing to include some additional space around our image. So over here, let's go ahead and we're going to turn off this display for one second. I'm going to grab my first three operators here, I'm going to scoot them down my network a little bit. And in here, I'm going to go ahead and insert an operator. I'm going to insert another composite. And then I'm going to go ahead and add a constant to my network. The constant I'm going to add uh, is going to be just white. That's fine. And I'm going to make it 2,000 pixels by 2,000 pixels. This source image is uh, 4096 by 2304. That's way too big for anything, right, uh, that we're going to be working on. In fact, that's a resolution that's really preposterous to begin with. I mean, you, we could argue about it, but um, for the, uh, the free version of Touch Designer that we're using, we're going to be capped at a resolution of uh, 1280 by 720, and at 720p, uh, this is too much resolution for us. We're never going to be able to output that. So uh, let's shrink this down a little bit. So using a 2K uh, image is going to be it's still way more resolution than we need, but uh, it's going to be a little bit more manageable. So I'm going to go ahead and composite these two. And I can see that, all right, it's squashed it to fit into this square shape, which is not what I wanted. So let's go ahead and fix that, right? So under transform, uh, let's use input 1, or excuse me, we're going to leave input 2 as a fixed layer, but for our prefit overlay, um, let's do something different there, right? Uh, what we can do there is uh, we should be able to do just native resolution. That's still going to be way too big, right? Of course it is. So what we're going to do before we get here is we're going to go ahead and insert another operator. And we're going to insert a transform. And we're going to use this transform 
to do some scaling for us. So here in this transform, we'll just go ahead and take the scale of this down a little bit, and we'll look over here to the sky to help us know which one it is that we want to use here. Okay, so now when we come over here, we can see that in this square, aha, perfect, we're not having any of these clipping problems that we were having before. Excellent. You know, taking a closer look at this, though, I can see that I probably have got too much space around this image. So let's go ahead and we're going to make that um, display for a hot second. And let's go ahead and turn down the vertical dimension of this a little bit, right? We can kind of dial this in. And maybe let's do something closer to like 1700. That's probably still a little bit big, but let's leave it there for right now and see if we're if we're happy with that. Okay. Excellent. Right. So this is looking better, but now we've got this problem where uh, this particular thing, if we were to view it, right? Well, first of all, it's enormous. Ay ay ay! What am I to do? And it's also this very strange shape, right? I've got this uh, 2,000 by 1,700 or 1 1.17 to 1 aspect ratio, and that's like useless uh, for most of the kinds of places that we work in terms of using pixels. So nice, thanks, Matt. Like that sucks. Well, let's go ahead and crop this then. So we're going to insert another operator, and we're going to insert a fit top. And our fit top is going to allow us to specify a resolution. So let's go ahead and say that we want 1280 by 720. Great. And while we're here, let's go ahead and in our fit, let's fill right on the fit page. Instead of fit best, let's fill horizontal. So now we've gone ahead and matched our horizontal aspect over here, right? Which is what I wanted. I'm still, uh, the edges of this are still falling off the edge of my raster, which is okay, but I'm not experiencing the clipping that I had before because all of that processing is happening over here. The feedback loop and the feedback loop that we have, we've got all this extra real estate in terms of alpha that exists around our image. And it's only here way downstream that we're actually trimming all of that off and getting it down to a size that's a little more manageable. So now what we end up with, if we were to view this guy, ah, yeah, this is closer to what I actually want it to be uh, looking like and feeling like. Okay, so I've just about got my whole render network set up here, right? So I've got this whole feedback system working. That's uh, pretty great. I've got my transform system. I'm fitting down to this. Excellent. Now let's go ahead and make a little more space here. I'm going to take this whole shebang, I'm going to make a copy of it. And this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and look at what I might do uh, to kind of do some other ways of experimenting with some, some transformations here. So in this case I'm going to go ahead and ditch both of these guys and I am going to add a noise chop. I'm going to use my noise chop. I'm going to go ahead and set this to be time sliced. Under the channel page, I know that I want uh, transform X and Y, and I want RZ. Those are the three channels that I want. I'm going to go ahead and select out TX and TY. I know that I'm probably going to uh, end up scaling those similarly. Oops, X and Y. And I'm going to have one more select. And this select will just be RZ. And I'm going to want to scale RZ differently because that's those rotation values. So I've broken these out, right? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to need another map. So 
So we'll need a math for this one and a math for this one. Those are going to get merged together. I like them to be in a nice tidy order here. Excellent. And now I can plug this right into my null, right? These are have the same names, which is very handy. Uh, but if we look here, whoa, something's not quite right. Our values are all cattywampus. There is some serious stuff happening here with our math because it's still all crazy. Let's go ahead and uh, we're going to box left both of those math, maths. We're going to reset all the parameters in them. Okay, now we've got this, whoa, jittery, noisy, crazy feedback thing uh, that is all over the place. Let's uh, turn that on for a second. Uh, woof, ultra, woof, never mind, let's not turn that on. That's very distracting. Okay, well, what can we do to make this a little bit better? First, let's look at our noise, and let's turn uh, our period down a little bit or excuse me, up a little bit. We want this to happen over a much longer chunk of time. So let's look at maybe more like 10 seconds. Okay, this has got a little more manageable kind of drift and flow to it. I can also see here that my num, my values, my translation values are just too large, right? I get uh, to 0 0.2, 0 0.5, that's, that's too much space that I've moved, moved along. So for my x and y, let's go ahead and set the range of negative 1 to 1 to being something more like uh, negative 0 0.15 to, or excuse me, 0 0.15, negative 0 0.15 to 0 0.15. Let's see what that looks like. Okay. There could be a little bit more there, right? Maybe not a ton, but we could go to like maybe 2.5 instead. Yeah. That's got a little more random quality, but it still mostly stays, mostly stays within the realm of where we can see it and understand what's happening with it. Let's take a look at our rotation values. Here we're going negative 1 to 1 is going to be negative 30 to 30. And that's that's working pretty pretty well for us here. I'm happy with that, I think, for the most part. The one thing I might do is I might actually make a little bit of space in here. And my rotation values, I might smooth just a, a smidge. Could use a lag for that. And the lag is going to just go ahead and, I mean, this is already much smoother given the, the period that we're dealing with, but it's going to smooth out those values even more. So we've got even gentler kind of curves and swoops. Yeah. Right, this has got a much more kind of triptych, drifting, uh, random uh, feeling to it. Those translation values still seem like a little bit high to me. So I would might turn them down just to 0 0.2. Yeah, we're And again, this becomes a process of really fine-tuning and finding something that you like visually that explores something that you think is interesting. So we can leave it for there for right now. Let's go ahead and grab these and scoot them over. We're going to insert a switch. We'll go ahead and plug our merge here into the switch, and this merge into the switch. And our switch will then get plugged right into our null. And our switch is going to allow us to choose between which one of these we want, right? So I've got this one here, and I've got this one down here. Zero is the first one in the stack, one is the second, right? So this allows me to bounce back and forth between what's going on over here in this uh, just very smooth, simple swirling motion versus this random noise down here. Okay, so this is well, all well and good, but I'm already seeing how I'm starting to get a network that is a little unwieldy, right? It's getting a little bit uh, kind of chunky. I've got a couple different things happening here. So what can I do to try and tidy this up a little bit? 
you know, first things first, I could see that um, these two operations that dive into this switch, I really don't necessarily need to see all of this like right to go. So let's go ahead and box select this guy, click inside of our network, and let's collapse selecting. So what I've done is that actually put everything here inside of a base, and it added an out for us automatically. So that's just kind of kept this very tidy for us. I might even call this one swirl, I could give it a name. And if I hit the C key on the keyboard, I could even give it a color. If I want to know that there was a chop network inside of there, I could give it that screen color. I'm going to do the same thing with my noise, with my random over here. I'm going to collapse the selected. I'm going to make it in the screen color. I'm going to call this in random. And you will notice that because I wasn't actually connected over here to my switch, I don't have an out. That's okay. We can actually just come in here and add an out chomp. When we add an out, that will actually add an outlet on the outside of our network. We'll see here in one moment, when we zoom out, lo and behold, there's our outlet. So we can plug that right into our switch. Alright, so now, what was that big, kind of wonky, complicated set of wires has been reduced down to just these four operators. That's much better. I like that a lot better. What else might I do? Oh, okay, I can see over here that I've got a lot of things going on over here in this network, right? I've got this null, and actually what I'm going to do with this null is I'm going to go ahead and call him BG. This is going to be the background for my container. I know that's coming, so I probably want to leave him here in this uh, kind of hierarchy of the network. But how about I think about maybe collapsing some of these things? Well, I think the first thing I might kind of consider is thinking about all of this prep work, right? So all of this stuff here is really about how I'm preparing something to go into my feedback system. In fact, if I think about it more closely, really what's happening is that this whole piece over here, this is all really my feedback system. And this is really my original asset. So here, if I was to make a little more space, I can see that this is the original asset that I'm pulling in. Over here, I've got the feedback uh, system that I've built, right? And what I needed to do is I had to transform that, I had to scale it down, and then composite it with some extra space, uh, some extra real estate in terms of pixels. And then I had this null in here to just kind of uh, make it easier to make that process happen. I can take him out for the time being. So I've got uh, this transform, I've got this composite, this constant, okay, great, I've got this feedback over here, I've got all of these things, and my background is actually what I want to deal with. So I can see here I've kind of got three modules. I've got my uh, incoming asset, I've got my feedback system, and then I have the thing that's actually my background. So let's think about how we could kind of consolidate that, right? So these three pieces, uh, that are going to be my input system, right? My source. I'm going to box select those. I'm going to collapse them. Give them a purple color. And we'll call this source. My feedback system. I'm going to go ahead and box select all of these guys. I'm going to collapse these. And we'll notice that in the action of collapsing this, we've actually maintained the references. So Touch Designer very cleverly knew in that process um, that when that happened, what it needed to do was, for our transform here, is it needed to uh, alter our expressions to make sure there was a pointer to the network above. That's really quite useful, very lovely. Thank you, Touch Center, I appreciate it. So now we've got our feedback system that's here inside of this network. I'm going to go ahead and color code this one purple. I'm going to call it feedback. Right. So already I'm starting to have something that's a little bit more tidy. I might shrink this down here a little bit more. Great. And I could scoot this guy over here. So before I had something that was much larger, a little more unwieldy, and now I've kind of streamlined that down uh, to a much more simplified version of all of these things. Right, if I wanted to take it a step further, I could even put uh, these three, I could encapsulate these three into their own network. 
I really wanted to be uh, super crazy tidy about the world, and I might call this something like control. I might call it like control preset. And now I really have just like slimmed this all the way down. Yours doesn't have to be this slim. It's all right with me if it's a, there's a little more space in it or a little a few more operations in it. But I want us to start to think about what are the modules that we can kind of shrink together. Because here in our source, right, like this is all all of the things that we think about in terms of or hopefully what we're thinking about in terms of uh, what we're sending out to our feedback system. Then over here in our feedback system, this is a kind of self-contained uh, feedback operation that we're working with. And then finally, the thing that's going to display. If we move out here, let's go ahead and take a look at our uh, container on the top level. And let's go ahead in the panel, let's use the background top to assign dot slash, look inside of me for the thing called PG. There it is. Now we'll notice that we've got some problems here. All right, well, that's a little bit weird, right? This is an aspect ratio uh, challenge that's happening. If we looked at the layout of our container, we can see that it's 400 by 300. But the contents of this container, right, like this guy is uh, 1280 by 720. So we need to think a little bit more carefully about how we got those two to match. And in fact, I want us to use some uh, kind of clever... Um, uses a, or a clever use of something called storage here in Touch Designer to address that. So let's take a look at what that's actually going to mean for us. Um, we haven't talked about storage yet. We're going to talk about it quite a bit on, on Tuesday, so I'm not going to belabor the point here. Uh, storage is something that exists at the component level, and so we can actually uh, put all sorts of information in the storage of this particular container. It's kind of uh, like we've used tables to hold on to information, storage is similar to that, but it's largely invisible to us unless we're looking at it specifically. Let's take a look at what that actually means. So I'm going to go ahead and open up, uh, I'm going to go ahead and add a text stat here to my network, and I'm going to put some things into storage. I'm going to make this viewer active, and uh, I'm going to uh, kind of go through the syntax here of how we put something into storage. So in this case, what I need to do first is I need to define what, uh, where I actually want to store this. So me.parent.store. The next thing I need to do is I need to assign this particular thing a key. right? What is the term or what's its uh, search string that I'm going to use to retrieve it? So I'm going to use width a comma, and then the value that I'm actually going to put into storage. That could be a string, it could be an integer, it could be a float, really could be just about anything you wanted. In this particular case, I'm going to go ahead and put um, some integers here into storage. I'm also going to go ahead and store a parameter for height. Or I'm going to store a, a key called height, and this is going to be 720. Okay, I'm going to make this uh, not viewer active here for a second. I'm going to right click on it, and now I need to run this script. And it's going to look uh, suspiciously as though nothing has happened. But if we come out of our container here and add an examine down and drag this component right on top of it, we can actually look at the, con uh, the contents of our storage. And we can see that I have something called width and something that's called height, I can see that they're integers, and I can see their values here. So we're going to go ahead and add an examine dat here inside of this network. And we want to examine this actual, right, this operator. So we're going to go ahead and uh, point to that by saying dot dot, look above me, which is the same as saying me dot parent. Okay, so now we can see that we have these things, uh, width and height, that are here inside of our storage. If we were to take this, right, let's make a copy of this, and let's put some different values in here. Like maybe instead we have uh, a different aspect ratio, like 10, 24 by 768. This should look remarkably similar to our assignment specifications. If I run this script, I can see that I've overwritten those two keys with these new values. Okay, so 
Well, let's think about how we could use this. I'm going to go ahead and call this 16 by 9. I'm going to call this 4 by 3. I'm going to go ahead and uh, leave these here in my network. We'll leave the argexam in here for a hot second. And we're going to add a button. Because I can imagine a situation where I might have uh, two different kinds of default resolutions that I know that I use for every gig, or uh, two resolutions that I know that I might potentially use for an output. And I'd like to be able to quickly use a toggle to change not only the uh, parameters of my container, right? but also to change some parameters here inside of my network. Because we'll actually look at how we can actually retrieve these values as well. Because, well, let's talk about that right now, right? So we put these into storage, but uh, where can I get these? Well, I can get them uh, here anywhere inside of the container um, by asking to fetch, excuse me, me.fetch, and using the key with. All right, this also, uh, the hierarchy of this is that once it's put into the parent, right, that's then gonna push all the way down into all the children. So for example, if I go here uh, into feedback, and I go to my fit top in my comment page, my resolution here, I can set to be fetch, excuse me, me.fetch, and I can fetch height, or excuse me, in this case, I want width and height. So now I've changed the resolution of this fit top, which means I've changed the resolution of the out, which in turn means I've changed the resolution of my end target null. So now I'm actually changing the resolution of this particular object just by changing what I have in storage. If I was to run this other piece, this other script, run this, I've turned my resolution up, I've turned my resolution down. We could then push this even further, right? So we could come all the way up here to our component and our component for the height and width. We can also fetch me.fetch. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the thing called width. I'm going to grab the thing called height. Excellent. So now I can actually change the parameters of this particular component by running this script also. Well, now I would really love to be able to like click on a button and have the button run that script for me. We've actually looked at how we can do that already. Um, but I want to push that a little bit further, right? I, I would love to not have to write these things again. Uh, it would be great if I could just leave them right here and then still be able to run them from uh, within the button. So let's look at that. First, let's let's fix some problems that we're going to have here with our button. So I would love my button, right, to have, when I turn, click on it, I want it to have a different name than when I don't have it clicked on. So let's come over here to this lovely uh, dat that already exists. We'll make it viewer active. We're going to add another column. I've got this little error here because I accidentally clicked on this little export flag and uh, thinks that there's a problem, but there's not. In fact, for our own sanity, let's go ahead and start with a new button, and I will try my best not to make that same mistake again. So we'll go ahead and add that here. We'll make this viewer active. We're going to add another row. We're going to call this text. We're going to take this dat, we're going to drag it right onto our button. We're going to specify that this is, in fact, the dat that we want to use to um, for all of our labels. We're going to get rid of the original text. We're going to see that it's going to start by saying state because it's looking at row 0, column 0. Row 0, column 0 is state. That is not what we want. We would like it to look at row 4. So, we'll, excuse me, column 4. Yikes, 0. Please look at column 4. And it should say text. This still isn't totally what I want, right? I'd like to take advantage of the fact that the state changes over here, right? What's happening in I. Um, would, uh, I would love what comes out of I to drive what happens in terms of our value. If we were to look at our button again a little more closely, 
we could see that for our state, we've got an expression over here that gives us a different value. 2 if I'm rolled over, 3 if I'm rolled over and the button's on, 1 if the button's just on, and 0 if nothing's on at all. Okay, how can I take advantage of that? Okay, so when the button is off, I would like this, right, so I haven't clicked on anything. This is 16 by 9. When the button is on, we're going to make this 4 by 3. I'm going to roll over my button, but it's still in the off position. So this is still in, at 16 by 9. I'm rolling over my button, and it's on. I want this to be 4 by 3. Okay. This should mean that we can change this now the way that we want it to. So here in uh, background, right, BG, I want to specify which row I want. So I'm going to look for the row that corresponds to the value that's coming out of the operator I. And out of I, I want you to look for the channel called state. And state should drive which one of these I'm in, right? Let's see if we've got it right yet. We'll open this up. Okay. We're off and it says text. That doesn't seem quite right. We're on and it says 16 by 9. Well, that's uh, one off here. I roll over. Okay, that's okay, right? So we're skipping the way that we should. And now we're in the off. Oh, we're in the rollover on position. And it says 4 by 3. What could be going on here? Oops. What I need to do is I actually need to just add one. I need to compensate for the fact that uh, my row zero is my header row. And so I want to start in the one row. So now I should see that my button behaves the way that I want it to. Perfect. OK. So last but not least, what I want to be able to do is I'd like to run these respective scripts based on um, what's happening here inside of my button. I'm going to go ahead and split my layout here for one moment so I can see two places at once. We're going to dive here inside of our button. We are going to add a panel execute dat. In our panel execute dat, uh, let's go ahead and bring up the parameters to make sure that we have this all set up the way that we want to. I want to take advantage of both the on to off state change or excuse me, the off to on state change and the on to off state change. Right, so in that particular case, when we think about on to off and off to on, off to on would be our zero to one change or zero to two change. Zero to one. Our on to off would be our one to zero change. I want to be able to use those guys. Perfect. And in fact, it's important to know that when I ask for state over here, state is coming from my panel value, not actually from my expression value. This expression is actually driving uh, how this table is being used instead of uh, this guy over here. Just the raw panel value, if we were to look at this one more time, we can see the raw panel value for state, right? On, off, on. So that's actually the number or the value that's going to be driving this particular thing. Since I'm only using off to on and on to off, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of these other functions. You're welcome to leave them in here. I just find it nice to have a little more streamlined setup here inside of uh, my execute dat so I can see what's going on. As you start to write more and more complicated scripts, Having conserved the space will start to mean more to you. OK. So now I need to do a few simple things, right? So when I go from off to on, my on position, we'll see, right? Let's look at this one more time. Oops. The on position is 4 by 3. OK. So for the off to on, that's where I want to set it to this resolution right here. So let's go ahead and call define for, uh, define this guy over here. We're going to look at a different way that we can actually run some scripts. 
So I want 4 by 3, and I'm using those alternating capitals as a convention for how I'm uh, naming my variables here. I want that to be the operator that is one network above me called 4 by 3. Right? 4 by 3 matches. What I'd like to do is I'd like 4 by 3 dot run with parentheses. This run uh, call is actually going to let me run this script rather than having to actually um, come out here, right click on it, and run it. Also, it allows me to run this script without having to embed all of this storage information here inside of my operator. So I'm going to do the same thing here. 16, 16 by 9 is the operator that's above me. 16 by 9. And I'd like 16 by 9 to run when I move from the on to off position. Okay. Let's see if we have any errors. Let's go ahead and make this viewer active. I'm going to turn off my parameters here. We'll keep a close eye on our uh, examine that, and we should see that when we run the script, ooh, we've got an error. Excellent. Uh, uh, what happened? We can middle mouse click here. It'll tell us that uh, line 18 is on to off, has no attribute run. Okay, great. What do we do wrong? Ah, aha. Oh my goodness gracious, look at this. Okay, 16 by 9. Over here, I've typed in 16 by 8. 16 by 9 is actually the name of this guy. Whew! Goodness. Okay, let's clear our script errors. Ah, oh, no errors there, because I just made that small little mistake. It's amazing what those will do to you. Uh, so we should see now that 16 by 9, there we are, uh, 1280 by 720, 1024 by 768. So now our button is changing our storage, right? So we're resetting our storage values. And our storage is then in turn uh, driving what's happening inside of multiple places of our network. That's excellent. Okay, let's back out here. Let's take a closer look at our uh, example that we've built. So now we could, should be able to see that lo and behold, we've got our feedback system here. Our top's working just the way that we want it to. Let's go ahead and get a little more re uh, real estate. Excellent. And while we're at it, let's set our buttons here to align left to right. And let's put them at the bottom. So I'm going to justify a vertical bottom. I like to have a little bit of space, a little bit of uh, gap in between my buttons. There we go. All right. So now we should see that if we were to view this, ah, lovely. We click this button and it opens up our uh, web browser for us. Excellent. And we can change the size of this. Perfect. All right. So now we've gone ahead and mimicked uh, just a little bit of feedback, right? So the next step in this would be, now that we've built something here that perfectly mimics uh, this particular system, well, what happens if we exploit that a little bit? So let's go ahead and make a copy. I'm going to look inside of my copy here. And now I'm going to look inside of my source, right? And I'm going to start uh, making some changes, right? I don't need these guys here. I would love to see what happens if I was to, for example, think about some uh, live rendering. If I hold down the control key, I can add multiple operators to my network. So I'm going to add a camera, a geometry, a light, and a render. Perfect. All right, these have all been added to my network. Move these back closer to my crosshairs. I don't know why I like them there, I just do. I'm going to go ahead and connect that to my out. I'm going to go ahead and set my look at my render. Okay, I like its dimensions. I'm going to dive into my geo and let's put some different things in here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, I think what I want to do is I want to add a grid. 
I want to apply some noise to that grid. I know already that I want to change this. I want abs time dot seconds. I want my grid to be bigger. I want it to be maybe like 16 by 9. You can use the A key to make this your active, H to take me home, which zooms me out a little bit. I don't want a mesh, I want a polygon. I'm going to go ahead and facet this. I'd like to, in faceting it, have unique points and compute the normals for those points. Great, so I've got this like chick -chick 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 kind of quality to it. You know, in thinking about this though, this is going to actually, this is cost, costing me half a millisecond. Uh, and in hindsight, I think I'm just going to go ahead and ditch that. I think I don't actually want that after all. I'm just going to go ahead and connect this to a null. Right, I'm going to display this and render it. Let's zoom out here. In our uh, camera, let's move back a little bit. Too far, wrong direction. There we go. Excellent. I'm going to go ahead and add a material. I want a fong. And I'm going to use a fong for a couple reasons here, right? I've got this light set up here. I'm going to drag my fong onto my geo and assign it as a material. I'm going to head over here to my common page and I'm going to make this a wireframe, right? This is a wireframe with lighting effects on it. Which I like. I'm going to turn up my wire width, maybe to like, what's three look like? Mm, yeah, let's do three. Okay. I see a couple funky things happening here. I'm going to forgive those for right now, I think. Uh, what I do want to do, though, however, is I want to change some colors around. So I'm going to change my diffuse color to maybe like a deep purple. I want to add some rim lighting and maybe we'll do like this blue. Just look at this. Mm. More blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't quite see that over here, but we could turn up our rim center. We rotate this guy a little bit. Right, we're just kind of starting to experiment with how do I want this set up so that I can start to get a, ooh, yeah. That's, now we're starting to jam, right? Let's come this way a little bit. Maybe, actually, in fact, what I want is I want abs time dot seconds. Probably want frame. To rotate this, that's too fast. Oh, here we go. Uh, so let's go ahead and multiply that maybe like by 0.1. Nice. Ooh, I like I'm liking that. Okay, so we're gonna take that. That runs here into our feedback system. So this transport and composite and all this business, I actually don't need that for this particular setup. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of those. All right, that's looking kind of crazy though, right? I like where this is going. It's got a nice kind of psychedelic feel. I think what I might want though is that before the feedback, I'm gonna go ahead and insert a blur operator because I want that to have a softer quality. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that up a little bit. I'm actually going to use that to feed my composite here as well. I'm going to take out this other one, right? So now I'm, I'm coming in, I'm applying a blur, I've got a feedback effect that's happening. It's maybe like too much blur. Yeah. Here in my transform, I'm scale evenly right now. I'm curious to see what happens, right? So let's reset this to one. If I start to think about scaling these disproportionately. So if I was to, you know, think about, oh yeah.
Now we start to end up with something that's got a kind of life of its own. It kind of moves and shifts in a way that, oh, I couldn't have totally predicted. If I was to turn the blur back up now, now I've got more of this kind of like drifting color field. If we were to come outside of this and take a look at what that looks like on black, right? That's a very different feeling, but still based on the same principle that's happening here in our feedback. So this is part of what I want you to start thinking about and what I want you to start experimenting with, right? Is that we're starting with a concept, we're just doing some copy art, we're trying to mimic something precisely. And then after we've mimicked it as exactly as we can, now we're starting to exploit that a little bit more and say, all right, well, what happens if I push that farther, right? What happens if I start to think about how to manipulate that, to change that, right? I start to get very different things. Uh, and this is where I think the fun really starts to happen for us. Hmm. Looking at this one last time, right? Like, our sweet spot is really like, max is out closer to like, ooh, not even 18 degrees. So we'd have to dive in here a little bit. Oops, wrong base. Maybe what we want to do is instead of negative 30, we only want to go like negative 12. Yeah. There we go. All right. So with that, we're going to spend a lot more time talking about some of the implications of this and some of the strategies for uh, playing with this. And then we'll actually take some time uh, to do some of that actual project work in class and also to play with this a little bit in class so we can start to dig in a little bit more. All right. Happy programming, everybody.